Welcome, viewers. It is time for another episode of Even Stranger Things from the Unsolved Mysteries of the X-Files and the Twilight Zone. I am your host, Mr. Lepree, here to take you on an odd and unexplainable journey through mysteries of the Wild West on today's episode. Today's special edition of Even Stranger Things focuses on two unexplained mysteries from the Old West, the first being the Thunderbird and the second the Lost Treasure of the Beale Ciphers. Both of these stories are based, at least in fact, whether or not you believe them is up to you. But all of them, you can research them on your own. And we'll start with Part 1, The Thunderbird. Once upon a time, in 1890. This story takes place in Tombstone, Arizona. Yes, a town called Tombstone, as if it wasn't creepy enough. On April 26, 1890, the local newspaper, the Tombstone Epitaph, published an incredible story. And I have it here, in red. If you can't see the headline, it's about to blow up for you. Found on the desert. A strange winged monster discovered and killed on the Huaca Desert. The beginning of the story reads as follows. A winged monster resembling a huge alligator with an extremely elongated tail and an immense pair of wings was found on the desert between the Whetstone and Huachuca Watlands last Sunday by two ranchers who were returning home from the Huachucas. The creature was evidently greatly exhausted by a long flight and when discovered was able to fly but a short distance at a time. After the first shock of wild amazement had passed, the two men, who were on horseback and armed with Winchester rifles, regained sufficient courage to pursue the monster and after an exciting chase of several miles succeeded in getting near enough to open fire with their rifles and wounding it. The creature then turned on the men, but owing to its exhausted condition, they were able to keep out of its way, and after a few well-directed shots, the monster partly rolled over and remained motionless. The men cautiously approached their horses, snorting with terror, and found that the creature was dead. The article then goes on to describe the creature in detail. They then proceeded to make an examination and found that it measured about 92 feet in length and the greatest diameter was about 50 inches. The monster had only two feet, these being situated a short distance in front of where the wings were joined to the body. The head, as near as the could judge, was about eight feet long, the jaws being thickly set with strong, sharp teeth. Its eyes were as large as a dinner plate and protruded about halfway from the head. They had some difficulty in measuring the wings as they were partly folded under the body, but finally got one straightened out sufficiently to get a measurement of 78 feet, making the total length from tip to tip about 160 feet. The wings were composed of thick and nearly transpa transparent membrane and were devoid of feathers or hair, as was the entire body. The skin of the body was comparatively smooth and easily penetrated by a bullet. And you might be wondering, how in the world is such a thing possible? This sounds more like a dinosaur than a bird. But I'm here to tell you that this reported instance was not the first case of such a creature being reported in the American West. In Native American legends, there was a creature known as the Thunderbird, a giant bird-like creature that was believed to control thunder. Many tribes have religious beliefs associated with these creatures, even considering them to have divine origins. From the Algonquins to the Sioux to the Winnebago and beyond, stories, descriptions, and images of Thunderbirds have appeared across Native American cultures, as you can see in works of art, cave, paintings. Anthropologists have speculated that Native American stories about the Thunderbird may have been the result of Native Americans finding bones and fossils of dinosaurs like the pterodactyl and creating a mythology about the origins of these remains. Others theorize that early tribes who arrived in North America thousands of years ago actually encountered nearly extinct species of giant, flighted creatures, but no physical evidence has been found to support this. And you'll see the description in the newspaper of the Thunderbird bears a very strong resemblance to a pterodactyl. But the central mystery remains. What actually happened in Tombstone, Arizona? What did these hunters actually encounter out in the desert? Was it an exaggeration or all a hoax? In the years following the article, photographs of the alleged creature have emerged, with many being debunked as fakes and forgeries, while others insist that a real photo does exist somewhere, many even claiming to remember it being published at the time, despite it not appearing in the original paper. The fact that they're misremembering this? Could this be 
another example of the Mandela effect. And here are just some of the photographs people allege are fake. The one on the top right is absolutely fake. I've seen the original where it's taken from. The others I have not seen, though. One plausible theory has been suggested is that the writer of the original article hatched a plot to try and save the struggling mining town of Tombstone by starting a hoax using legends from local Native American tribes as a way to attract tourists and other interested parties to the town with a fake story about one of these legendary creatures. This occurred around the same time as many similar stories of fantastical finds in digs throughout the Old West. Bones and fossils of extinct animals such as dinosaurs are being discovered, with many of the finders putting them on display for a fee as a way to make a living. Some of these business people even assembled bones of different creatures together to claim they had discovered some new incredible species, which they would exhibit in traveling carnivals for money. These rumors spread like wildfire and would take years and decades for research to debunk these stories and correct the record. For example, in this picture on the right, um, the Hyjarchos was one instance of such a hoax where bones were assembled and claimed to be the remains of a giant sea serpent, when in reality it was just bones assembled from separate animals and put together to resemble a totally new species. So is this 1890s story of the Thunderbird sighting fact or fiction? You be the judge. Uh, could this have really been a nearly extinct species that still somehow existed in the isolated American West, which at that time was nearly untouched by human contact? Or was it really just a hoax inspired by Native American folklore that was used to try to attract visitors to the town? Regardless, stories like this pop up in several places across the West, not only in Arizona, but also in California. And you'll find many uh, such cases of people reporting sightings and other Native American legends describing these creatures. But in the end, I leave it in your hands. Now for story number two, the lost treasure of the Beale Ciphers. Once upon a time, in 1821. This story starts, sort of, in Lynchburg, Virginia. In the lobby of the Washington Hotel, which I don't believe is there anymore. A man named Thomas Beale one day in 1821 came in to stay at the Washington Hotel and befriended the hotel's owner, Robert Morris. Before leaving the hotel, Beale gave Morris a locked iron box, saying he would return for it, and that he could only open it himself if Beale failed to come back for it. Years went by, and Beale never came back for the box. Morris's curiosity went out, and he decided to open the box after waiting ten years for Beale to return. Inside the box, Morris found something that would become his obsession for the next twenty years. Inside the box were three pieces of paper with these numbers inscribed on them. Three separate pieces of paper with these numbers inscribed on them in this exact order. Morris was familiar with what these were, cipher texts, encoded messages that needed a cipher or key to properly decode them and unlock their meaning. These sorts of things were used by the military in the Revolutionary War and War of 1812 to pass along secret messages. We did one of these ourselves earlier in the year. Uh, the secret messages from the code book that the Revolutionary War soldiers use. This one is not all that different. But the texts were useless to Morse, unless he could discover the key needed to decipher them. The key was usually a piece of writing commonly known, like the Bible, or some other document that would have been known to the coder. In the case of the Revolutionary War soldiers, we had their book. In this case, Morse did not have the text they were using to decode. Now, Morris died before he could make any progress on the ciphers, but he entrusted them to a friend to continue the hunt. This friend published a pamphlet about the ciphers and went to work trying to crack the codes. On a hunch, he theorized that Beale used the Declaration of Independence, a common American text, as the key to encode the messages. Shades of National Treasure This is how the decoding was done using the Declaration of Independence. The second Beale cipher, like the other two, contains about 800 numbers, beginning with the sequence 115, 73, 24, 807, 37. The pamphleteer guessed that each number corresponded to a word in the Declaration of Independence. For example, the first number in the sequence is 115. The 115th letter of the Declaration of Independence is instituted, which begins with the letter I. Hence, the first number, 115, represents the letter I. The second number in the sequence is 73. The 73rd word in the declaration is hold, which begins with the letter H. Hence, the second number, 73, represents the letter H. And here I have the source for it if you want to check it out. 
Using this process, one of the cipher texts was decoded to read out as the following message. I have deposited in the, country, in the county of Bedford, about four miles from Buford's, in an excavation or vault six feet below the surface of the ground, the following articles. The deposit consists of 2,921 pounds of gold and 5,100 pounds of silver, also jewels obtained in St. Louis in exchange for silver to save transportation. The above is securely packed in iron pots with iron covers. The vault is roughly lined with stone and the vessels rest on solid stone and are covered with others. This is Bedford, Virginia, by the way, in case you got too excited. But Morse's friend hit a snag. While the Declaration of Independence could be used to decode one of the cipher texts, when used on the other two, the writing didn't make any sense, sense which meant that Beale had probably used a separate cipher for each text. The Declaration of Independence was only the key to one of the three coded messages. The other two key texts remained a mystery. Morris's friend died as well before he could decode the other texts, but he published his research for those who wanted to follow in his footsteps. Treasure hunters theorize that the other two texts, if decoded, will provide the exact location and additional details of the Beale treasure. The Beale Papers, the published pamphlet, is a compilation of all the research made by Morris and his friend. They contain additional information about Richard, excuse me, Thomas Beale himself and how he came to acquire such a fortune. According to Beale papers, Thomas Beale and around two dozen companions ventured out west to hunt buffalo around 1817. They strayed into modern-day New Mexico, which was then land owned by Spain. While there, they discovered a mine with a large supply of gold and precious metals. They spent the next 18 months on the site, digging up riches from the mine. At the end of the dig, the group charged Beale with transporting the treasure back east to Virginia to make sure they kept it secret and hidden from Spain and native tribes. To make sure the location would be known to his partners, in case something happened to him, he wrote down where the treasure was and how to get to it on encoded ciphertext, which he then entrusted to Robert Morris of the Washington Hotel. The fact that Beale never returned for the texts may mean someone was after him and chasing the treasure. The search for the treasure has continued ever since, with no one having yet successfully decoded the two remaining texts from the iron box. So is there really some old western treasure lying buried out in Virginia? Or is this too just a tall tale meant to entertain adventurers? Once again, I let you be the judge. Until next time, this has been another episode of Even Stranger Things from the Unsolved Mysteries of the X-Files and the Twilight Zone. Hope you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.